There is a reason why so many people say that gardening is their therapy. Gardening helps us cultivate joy and weeds out stress in our life. Love the plant puns. Get ready. This episode is going to be chock full of them. For so many reasons, gardening brings us into the present. It allows us to tap into awe, which naturally raises our sense of well-being. It gives us a sense of accomplishment, of ownership, of empowerment. It connects us to others. In garden societies, in garden clubs, or just in the tips and advice neighbors swap with each other. And honestly, plant friends, there is no better feeling than the delight that you get from picking a flower or an herb or a tomato that you have tenderly cultivated over a span of time to share with friends or to enjoy for yourself. Gardening helps us process life and death, death and rebirth, natural cycles. It helps us process the passing of time. It's magic. It's therapeutic. Garden is truly therapeutic, and I totally subscribe to the catchphrase, garden is therapy. So in the peak of the gardening season, for those of us in North America, I wanted to take an entire episode to celebrate not just how we tend to our gardens and how to grow the things growing in our gardens, but how to use our gardens, how to use ourselves as a deeper conduit to engage with nature and to celebrate just how therapeutic gardening can be and arm our community with free tools and tips to enrich your gardening experience and make this the most joyful gardening season yet. So welcome back. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hello, my plant friends. You might notice that the sound of the podcast is a little bit different today. And that's because I'm recording this podcast outside in my garden. I figured if I was going to record a podcast all about garden therapy, I needed to be in the balcony where it happens, my balcony garden. I've got about 25 grow bags. I'm sitting on my balcony. My computer is kind of jerry-rigged so you can see some of the garden in the background. So today you are going to have beautiful ambient noise of the running water of the stream on my property, of the hummingbirds that come to and fro and feed the hummingbird feeders. If you follow me on Instagram, you know I'm a crazy hummingbird lady. I live for my hummingbirds in the summer. You are going to hear all of the bird song from the woods that surrounds my property. You might hear the occasional airplane. Right now, I am looking at a very chubby groundhog, a mama groundhog, who basically runs the place. She runs my property. She's going to be a part of this this podcast. My balcony is on the second floor of my house. It's very large. It's where I grow everything because we have so many deer that eat all of our plants and groundhogs. And actually, Mrs. Mama Groundhog is out and about right now. I'm making eye contact with her from my balcony. She's down below. She's so chubby. She has three babies who hang out on our lawn every day and eat all my plants. So anyway, she's here. I don't know if you can hear the buzzing, but there's a hummingbird right behind me. It's eyeballing the feeder because I'm sitting right next to it. But anyway, I felt like it was important that I put myself in my garden, which has brought me so much joy. My garden that has been so therapeutic as we talk about using our garden as a therapeutic tool today on the podcast. I also wanted to bring something to your attention. I am wearing sunscreen in my garden today because if you have been following me on Instagram, you'll know that I've recently been diagnosed with melanoma, plant friends. At 34 years old, with no family history, I have melanoma on my face. It is from skin damage. So for the next six months, if you follow me on Instagram, you're going to be going through my melanoma journey. I'm going to have to be getting some extensive surgery to get it removed. I'm very fortunate that we caught this melanoma very early. My life is not at risk, but we have to get it removed. And sun protection for gardeners is becoming a much larger part of this platform. We might even do an episode on it with my dermatologist. But while you're in your gardens, plant friends, wear sunscreen. And if you're interested in following the melanoma journey and my process of going to all clean skincare, I'm going to be testing different SPFs. I'm going to be testing different sunscreens. I'm going to be talking about how you can have sun protection in your gardens. You can follow me on Instagram at Growing Join Maria to follow the journey. But 
I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm so fortunate we caught it this early. So no stress, but I did feel like I had to say that to you guys, to those listeners who who are not following me on Instagram, because it's begin- you're going to hear more about it in the coming months. And also, you know, being confronted with skin cancer at such a young age has really, it's been a whirlwind of the last few weeks, <laughs> to be honest. Getting the diagnosis, I went into the dermatologist thinking I had melasma and I came out with a skin cancer diagnosis. That really rocked my world and has just knocked such a profound sense of immediacy, of presence, of gratitude for the life that I have, and has even knocked this feeling and this understanding of using plants as therapy and how therapeutic the garden can be. As I've been going through my first rounds of meetings with surgeons and dermatologists and oncologists, my garden has been my respite. It really has. And I've heard that from so many people who have struggled with, you know, life-threatening illnesses or PTSD or just trauma in general. The garden can be therapy. And I'm not saying that it should be replaced with actual therapy or medicine or whatever else you need in your mental health journey. But boy, oh boy, can your garden be a really powerful tool for helping you regulate your nervous system as as life throws you curveballs. I can speak this from experience. If you've been following me on this three-year journey, sometimes it feels like all I get is thrown curveballs in life, but I know that they're all teachers and Mother Nature has my back. So last month I shared an episode on how to overcome burnout through connecting with nature, and I got such an overwhelmingly positive response from you listeners about it. So I'm going to experiment with more solo episodes like this one, exploring how we can use our houseplants, our gardens, our local parks, our nature that surrounds us as a tool for wellness, in addition to the normal episodes that we have that are more centered around how to care for plants. But these episodes are going to be how to use plants to care for ourselves. And if you don't already know, I have a whole book on this topic on how to use plant care as self-care. It's called Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness. And if any of this episode resonates with you, you're going to love my book and you should pick it up. It'll be linked in the show notes. So Before we dive into the nine strategies and tools and tips that I want to give you for how to make this your most joyful gardening season yet, how to squeeze all the juice out of the lemon of your garden, how to get the most you can from your gardening experience, I want to kind of zoom out and talk about the why behind gardening being so important. When I was doing research for my book, Growing Joy, I read that the average American spends about 90% of his or her time indoors. And this statistic was taken before the pandemic. So I'm assuming now that we've all been social distancing and our lives have changed, I'm guessing that that statistic is even higher than 90%. But yes, we spend the majority of our lives indoors, disconnected from nature, looking at screens, breathing in dusty air, surrounding ourselves with objects and material that are not natural, that are in disconnection with the organic material that our bodies are made up of. Our society has become so far removed from the older generations go outside and play until sunset and come home. It is so wild. If we think about how our parents were raised, even just we were raised if you're a millennial, like how much time I spent outdoors as a kid versus how much time I spend outdoors as an adult is absolutely mind boggling at how different it is. And it's hugely disappointing, honestly. I'm as guilty as it comes here with how tasty all of these streaming apps and social media apps and screen time and air conditioning and all of these things, it's so easy to stay indoors. It's so easy to become part of the statistic, right? To be one of those people who spends 90% of your time indoors. It's easy. And I've totally been there. I've totally like had days go by, maybe 48 hours that I haven't left my house because I work from home and I live in the woods. So I don't go outside that often unless I push myself. But it is that knowledge of how disconnected we are as humans from nature. It's that knowledge that then turns into a responsibility. So I need to know that because I am so predisposed to be spending time indoors as an entrepreneur who works for herself, who lives kind of in an isolated environment, I have to understand that, yeah, my hobbies are indoor hobbies my job is an indoor job. So I need to have the responsibility and the awareness to make sure that I am getting outside. I am connecting with nature. And if I can't get outside, I'm surrounding myself with plants so I can at least experience nature indoors. But today we're focusing on outdoors because we're focusing on gardening as it is the middle of gardening season. So when we get into our gardens, we get so many positive therapeutic benefits. We experience monotasking 
we multitask, especially if you're a woman, like we multitask way too much. We're streaming something, but also on our phone, but we're also eating, like we're doing too many things at once. And so frequently when you're in your garden, you are focused on weeding. You are focused on pruning. You are focused on planting. Your hands are dirty. You can't be touching other things. So just that beautiful experience of monotasking, of having like this deep focus on one thing is so good for your brain and your body. We're also engaging with natural sense. That's so good for our, our nervous system. We're getting that gorgeous sensation of dirt under our fingernails, which brings us so much joy. But we're also in the garden. We're creating space. You know, I always say you're connecting with nature to connect with yourself. So in your garden, you're taking time to connect with nature. But really, in that time that my hands are in my grow bag and I'm thinning the carrot seeds that I just planted or I'm pruning suckers on my tomato plant, it's really just carving out time for my own thoughts, <laughs> for my own brain. You know, we're so screen addicted. We're on all these social media apps. We're in our emails. We're in our calendars. We have so much media and so much of other people's thoughts and experiences being pushed at us at all times. Even if you live in a city and you walk down the street, you're being accosted by other people's energies at all times, right? So it's very hard to access your own life force energy and your own original organic thoughts, right? But when you connect with nature, that really is a sacred time to carve out for yourself, to just let your mind wander, to let your mind feel nothing. But it's kind of like how people talk about how you get your best ideas in the bathroom, you get your best ideas in the shower when you're kind of not doing anything. It's very similar when you're in the garden. I get my best ideas in the garden. And sometimes I don't get any ideas in the garden. And that's why I feel so good because my mind is just able to be at rest. There are a lot of studies now also that are proving that exposure to nature can do a myriad of amazing things for our bodies and our well-being, like increasing our capacity for empathy, generosity, and trust, helping hospital patients recover faster with fewer painkillers, make us happier. There was a study I read that said that the mere presence of trees in urban areas can decrease depression rates and improve your sense of well-being. Another study I read said that being around nature can make you feel as good as getting a $10,000 raise. Another study I read showed that sitting in nature can lower your cortisol levels by 12%. Cortisol is your stress hormone. So there's studies that are really proving that just being in nature, like just the act of going outside, of being in nature, of looking at trees is going to make you feel better. It's going to reduce your stress, increase your joy, increase your calm. But you know this because you're a gardener already. You're already tending your garden. I don't have to convince you of this plant, friends. But anyway, I just thought that you might want to nerd out on the studies with me and you might just want to like hear, hear the context that I felt like this episode needed to be set up. So I have a list of nine therapeutic garden activities that I'd like to offer you that you can start implementing into your garden time if you aren't already to have the most joyful gardening season yet. And listen to this episode while you're gardening. <laughs> Why not, right? I love listening to podcasts while I garden. So the first practice that I want to talk about is using your garden visits as a self-care reflection moment. So in my book on page 27, I have a chart of garden routines that you can do and questions to ask yourself while you're doing them. So I'm going to run through this chart with you. So you're going into your garden naturally because you're watering your plants every day, you're pruning, you're weeding, you're doing your garden chores. So instead of just going into your garden to thoughtlessly do these things, I'd love to offer these different ideas. They're kind of like journaling prompts for an active meditation, right? If we're going to look at gardening as an active meditation, if you don't like sitting and, you know, chanting, oh, <laughs> just get in your garden. So here are some thoughts that you could bring to your, your gardening practice that might enrich your experience. So when you're watering your plants, ask yourself, how hydrated am I today? On the surface level, right? I don't drink enough water. I drink too much coffee. So when I'm watering my plants, I'm reminding myself to water myself. But more importantly, then I go one step deeper and I think, what aspects of my life are dehydrated? What aspects of my life have I completely forgotten to water that are withering at the stem and might need a little bit of resuscitation? Where in my life do I need to go drench with some water? It might be my relationship. It might be this podcast. It might be a friendship with a friend that I've forgotten to call for a month, right? But as you're in this you know, meditative moment with your watering can, think about what needs to get watered in your life. And then do one thing that day to go water that aspect of your life, whether it's making a phone call to a friend that you that is long overdue, whether it's 
making a doctor's appointment. Maybe it's making that dermatologist appointment that you haven't done. We should all be getting annual dermatologist appointments. Maybe it's scheduling a date night with your partner. Whatever it is, you can take one action that day towards resuscitating that withered aspect of your life. In a similar note, I love turning checking your soil for moisture levels into a mindful moment. So there's two different ways that you can check your soil for moisture levels. You can jam your finger into the soil or you can completely remove your sense of feeling out of it, right? You could use a a moisture meter, but you could jam your finger into the soil, just rip it out, see if it's wet or not, and then water or not according to whatever your senses gave you. Or you can turn this into a mindful moment. So if you notice, when soil is wet, it's cooler. And when it's dry, it's hotter. So can you actually like try and engage every single sense you can possibly in this moment to measure your soil moisture? Can you dip your finger gently into the soil and then rub the soil between your two fingertips and notice what temperature it is and notice the composition of it and really just have a beautiful sensory moment. Maybe you inhale the soil. You know, there's all sorts of microbes in soil that are so good for us to inhale. Do you notice the different colors? What are you seeing when you look at it? Is it looking like gray and depleted of nutrients? Maybe you have to hit it with some fertilizer or is it looking like that dark, gorgeous, rich soil for, you know, manure compost that our plants are going to love to live in and soak up all those nutrients and grow big and strong for us that summer? Like how many of your senses can you engage in that mindful moment. And then on a deeper level, it's another check-in with yourself, right? How do you feel in your body? I feel like that mindful moment where you're engaging your, your sense of touch, like can you drop into your body for a moment? Are you tired? Are you hungry? Do you need exercise? And make a plan to maybe get better sleep the next day, to maybe book a workout class, or for me, it's getting on my Peloton, you know, even if I just do quick hit 10-minute class. Maybe you can make yourself a delicious meal with some of the plants that you've grown in your garden. But can you turn that soil moisture moment into a mindful drop into the physical present moment for that actual measuring of the soil moisture and then also for your life? Thank you to our episode sponsor, Espoma Organic, a longtime partner of the podcast. If you don't know already, you got to know who they are. Espoma Organic is a family owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets and the planet. As we are deep into growing season, plant friends, we've got to talk about feeding. It's feeding time. We know I love Espoma's line of potting mixes and soils that I've been planting my my house plants and my garden plants in. I'm so thankful for their line of fertilizers and plant foods that make feeding our plants so easy. You can't mess it up. So with fertilizing, there's liquid fertilizer types of people, and then there's granular fertilizer types of people. And Espoma has you covered, whichever type of person you are. If you're liquid, they have liquid fertilizers that are super easy. They come in a bottle. You screw the top off. The top is the measuring cap. You put the liquid fertilizer into your watering can, and then you just water your plants. So I use their liquid tomato tone for my tomatoes, their liquid indoor for my house plants. I just pour their indoor fertilizer into my house plant watering can. It makes fertilizing my house plants so easy. They've also got bloom and grow liquid fertilizers as well that are so easy to use. You probably have heard of Espoma because of their famous line of tones, their tone family of fertilizers. They've been around for 85 years. They're packed with natural proteins, beneficial microbes. When you use them on your plants, they're going to thank you with strong roots, deep green foliage, and beautiful big blooms and harvests. Espoma Organic has been trusted for generations. These products are filled with long-lasting organic ingredients that break down slowly every time you water. And they have a tone for specifically like any type of plant you're growing. (laughs) They have garden tone for your garden, berry tone for your berries, rose tone, azalea tone, bulb tone, flower tone, and of course, tomato tone. If you're growing tomatoes, you got to be putting the tomato tone on your tomatoes to make sure they come out nice, ripe, juicy, and delicious. To learn more about all of the indoor and outdoor products that Espoma has for you, go to espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront where I have a list of curated Espoma products that I love to use. Once again, that's espoma.com to find your local Espoma dealers or my Amazon storefront Espoma list of my loved products. 
you know, I'm always a broken record with the pruning metaphor, but when you're pruning your plants, right, if you're in your garden and you're going through and you're weeding, you're pulling out the plants that you don't want, you're pulling off the yellow leaves. I currently, in one of my grow bags, I have borage that just did not, I bought it to, I think like blown out from the garden center, but this barge is, it's just all yellow. It was kind of yellow when I bought it. I shouldn't have bought it, but I just really wanted it. So I'm removing those yellow leaves today, right? And as I'm removing those yellow leaves, I can take a minute and take stock of my life. Okay. What bad habits do I need to prune out of my life? What toxic people do I need to maybe cut away? What behaviors or or negative self-talk am I noticing come up that is sucking life force energy out of me and needs to just be removed in order to make new space for growth? And then also, you know, we're in the throes of gardening season. So when you're fertilizing your plants, like what area in your life do you want to fertilize? Like where do you want to put some gas? Like where are you growing? Where are you thriving, right? This all doesn't have to be negative. When you're fertilizing, if you have a new bloom in your garden, like what new bloom in your life can you take a moment to celebrate with that new bloom? If you harvest a tomato, like what fruits of your labor are you enjoying in your life as well? So I just feel like there's so many garden life parallels that you can celebrate in that daily in and out of caring for your garden. And I feel like the longer you get through the garden season, the more grueling and annoying the daily garden tasks become because it gets monotonous and they're not novel anymore. So the more that you can like turn them into these mindful reflection, almost like moving journaling moments with your mind, if that makes any sense, the better. All right, so now we're going to dive more into engaging your senses. So the next the two through six of these nine practices is now going to be how to engage your senses in the garden. So one, obviously seeing, right? Like look at your plants, right? Okay, fine, Maria. What an earth shattering concept, Maria. Thank you so much. But it's not just looking at your plants, but it's how can you drop into the present moment with your sense of sight? I am looking right now at a gorgeous lemon citronella pelargonium that I have. The leaves on this plant, the outline of the leaves is so gorgeous and unique. And I could go walk over to this plant and I could take five deep breaths and just with my eyes trace the outline of the leaves and drop so presently into this moment in five breaths. That's going to take you less than 30 seconds, right? But I can be so present with this plant through my sense of sight. I could look on the underside of the leaves and trace the veins of the plant. I could even engage my sense of touch with my sense of sight and follow the veins of the leaves with my fingers. I could trace the outline of the leaves with my fingers as I trace them with my sight. I could scan my collection and see how many different shades of green I could notice in one like quick scan of my plants. I could celebrate the bright orange calendula that I am growing that is such a shockingly gorgeous orange and it is such a different texture of my garden. I'm growing nothing else orange besides these calendula and they just like jump out at me every time I see them, right? Like how can you just bathe in the gorgeous gift of sight that you have and appreciate it so deeply? So that's just a reminder for, you know, a second activity you can do. Third, smell. So of all our senses, and I I was surprised learning about this research in my book, smell is actually one of the most powerful and unique senses we have because our nose and the olfactory system is a straight shot to the part of our brain associated with long-term memories and emotions. And I think people don't understand that when we're in nature, we're benefiting from not just the view of the nature, but the scent of nature. So I'm surrounded by trees right now. I don't smell the tree, but there are VOCs being emitted from the trees and from the plants in my garden that I'm smelling in that fresh air scent. And our bodies, our human bodies are predisposed to feel at ease when we're smelling natural plant scents. So with smell, can you grow scented plants? so that you can benefit from them. I have an herb garden and I smell my rosemary and my basil every day. It's actually part of my morning routine. When I make my coffee, the pour over is trickling through. I go outside and I smell my rosemary and basil. And it's a way that I just kind of stimulate my brain when I wake up in the morning. I have a whole episode on the podcast, just a couple of episodes down this feed on aromatic gardening. If you want to learn more about how to grow like a scented garden, a garden that is inspired by scent, it's like a scent forward garden garden, aromatic gardening, and all of the different benefits of all the different types of plant smells, you can go scroll and listen to that episode with Amy Anthony. It's an amazing episode. 
But another thing about scent is all plants emit VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and the plants actually use these VOCs to communicate with each other. So that smell of fresh cut grass is actually the grass alerting the other grass blades that, oh no, intruder, intruder, something's cutting me down. Same with roses. Like every scent that you smell in nature is actually the plant's way of communicating. And I think that's really cool that a plant might be trying to communicate with us by emitting the scent. So can you just get your nose all up in those tomato leaves, all up in your herbs, and allow the scents to tickle your brain and kind of just spark that joy in your life? Okay, the next sound, bird song. If you have a garden, you're probably attracting pollinators to your garden. I've talked about her a couple of times on my podcast, but my friend Pam lives in Massachusetts and We did an episode on growing joy, and she talked about growing her garden. One of the biggest benefits was the fact that she brought so many birds back to her town, to her neighborhood, because the birds were coming to her flowers, you know, as pollinators. And you're listening to the bird song that I get to hear every day when I'm on my balcony. But really taking a moment when you're in your garden to engage your sense of sound, to engage your ears. Can you listen? Can you count how many birds are present in your garden? I am obsessed with this app called the Merlin ID app. It's a bird identification app, and it is absolutely incredible. I have gotten so many people to download this app. They should sponsor me if they don't. But Merlin ID, you can download the app, and then it has like a sound identification. So when I sit out on my balcony at night, I turn the sound identification on. It makes a recording, and then it tells me how many different birds are present and which birds are singing which song. So I've learned the sound of bird calls through this app. It's amazing. I'll link it in the show notes, but that would be a super fun activity for you to do, especially with your kids, because in the app, when it tells you, oh, that was a Blue Jay, you can click on Blue Jay and then you can learn all about the Blue Jay. So I'm hyper fixated on this app. I'm obsessed with it. And it's totally free to download as well. And if you live in a place where, you know, you have a small garden or you're gardening in a city and you don't get to benefit from birdsong and you're really just listening to like trucks and planes, I hear you. I lived in 500 square feet in New York City for 10 years. I've totally been there. The hack is to open YouTube and put in nature sounds. And there are so many like eight to 10 hour long YouTube videos that are nature and garden sounds. So if you can't access that birdsong in nature, access it on your computer and play it throughout your workday. So when I wrote my book, Growing Joy, there was one YouTube video that I listened to every day. It was eight hours and I would listen to it all day. I would write all day. And then when it stopped, I knew it was time for me to go have dinner or take a break. But our brains, like we love birdsong and rushing water. And as humans, you know, we evolved around water and birds and and we are nature. So it's very relaxing for us to hear those sounds instead of just like normal white noise. So give it a try. Next, touch. We talked about this, but how many different ways can you engage your sense of touch in your garden? Obviously, I said, you know, trace outlines of leaves. Can you take a mindful moment and feel all of the different types of leaves that you have in your garden and notice the different types of cuticles? Some of them are waxy. Some of them are fuzzy. My tomato leaves are fuzzy, but my dahlia leaves are totally like slick. My borage leaves are spiky and actually kind of hurt when I touch them. How many different sensations can you create for your fingertips? Can you close your eyes and feel them? Feel your tomato leaf with your eyes open and then feel your tomato leaf with your eyes closed and notice how much more sensitive your sense of touch is when your eyes are closed. But just play with that, right? And I'm not saying you have to go and like blindfold yourself and touch your plants for, (laughs) sounds so weird, for 30 minutes. I'm saying literally... You can take three deep breaths and do this and experience the benefits. Oh my gosh, I just got dive bombed by two hummingbirds. (laughs) I freaking love hummingbirds so much. Also for sight or for touch, have hummingbird feeders so you can just watch your local hummingbirds all day. They bring me so much joy. I can't even stand it. If you like hummingbirds, you should follow me on social media at Growing Joy with Maria because I feel like my Instagram is basically like a hummingbird appreciation account at this point. Taste. Oh yeah, baby. When you taste a homegrown tomato, you're never going to be able to buy a store-bought tomato again, right? There's such a difference. So how can you incorporate taste in your daily garden experience? Now, Dr. King Lee, the forest bathing scientist that I'm obsessed with, I, I wrote about him in my book a lot. He talks about even just when you go forest bathing, like tasting the air. Can you taste the air? So when you're in your garden, like can you 
taste what that clean garden air kind of tastes like. It sounds kind of weird and crazy to talk about, but just do it. (laughs) It's going to drop you into the present moment. But obviously, if you're growing edibles, if you're growing herbs, if you're growing plants that you can eat, can you make something so delicious with them? Can you share the tastes with people around you? I had a summer solstice party and I plucked all of my tomatoes off of my hydroponic planter indoors and I made my mom's bruschetta recipe and I shared it with my friends. And it felt so good to see their eyes light up at these plants that I grew, you know, from the taste of these plants that I grew. But how can you really play with your taste buds in your garden? And if you're a weirdo like me and you're also obsessed with hummingbirds, you'll make hummingbird nectar for them and then you'll always taste it because it's basically sugar water. (laughs) No wonder hummingbirds are so happy all the time. Okay, the seventh practice that I want to talk to you about is planty affirmations. I'm going to open up to the page in my book. I have like three pages of planty affirmations for you in my book. I'll read you a few right now. But basically, the concept behind planty affirmations is many people I know. I don't know many people who don't struggle with self-esteem. I certainly struggle with self-esteem. And the thought is, you know, when you get plants, it's so easy to talk to your plant babies. When I get up in the morning, I come outside and I say hi to my plant babies and I talk like a real weirdo to them. I'm like, good morning, my plants. How are you? Let's have a good day today, right? It's so easy to be so kind to your plants. Like the levels that we go to care for our plants versus the levels we go to care for ourselves, I will not run a humidifier for myself. I don't care if I'm breathing in 15% humidity air and like crack, my lungs are crackling. But if my houseplants need a humidifier, I will run a humidifier for my houseplants, right? That's kind of messed up. We take care of our plants and other things so much more than we take care of ourselves. So the thought is, I have a list of plant affirmations in my book that you can easily say to affirm your plants. You are growing so beautifully, my little tomato plant. I am so proud of you, right? And if you say that to your tomato plant every day, you are growing so beautifully, tomato plant. I am so proud of you. Then maybe slowly but surely, you might be able to say that to yourself, right? You are growing so beautifully, Maria. I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you, Maria. I am proud of you, tomato plant baby. I am proud of me, Maria. So the concept, you affirm your plants and then ideally you're also affirming yourself. Okay, so the affirmations are on page 90. So here are a couple. You can say to your plants and then say to yourself, you grow girl or you grow plant. Keep growing, my plant friend. I'm proud of you. I honor your dormancy and I trust you will awaken at your perfect time. I have said that to myself so many times. We need to experience dormancy sometimes. I honor your dormancy and I trust that you will awaken at the perfect time. If you are feeling a season of dormancy in your life right now. Trust that you will awaken at the perfect time. Stand tall and let yourself bloom, little plant. I say that to my sunflowers all the time. Let yourself bloom. Stand tall. You are deserving of love, nutrients, and kindness. You are deserving of love, nutrients, and kindness. So I have like two more pages of affirmations in my book if you need more support, but I have a feeling that you probably have your own list of affirmations that you're already saying to your plants, but can you practice them on a daily basis? Even just the feeling of that kindness that you experience just expressing kindness to something else, that's going to fill you up. That's going to increase your sense of well-being if saying these affirmations to yourself feels too weird. But I will tell you, I have these affirmations written on post-its in my bathroom on my refrigerator door, on my bedroom door, on my office wall. Like I have these affirmations plastered all over my home. You are growing beautifully is a very powerful affirmation for me and expand and unfurl. A visual for me of an unfurling monstera leaf has been very powerful in the last couple of years. And I have expand and unfurl all over my my home. So if that helps you, please take it and write it on post-its as well. And report back. If you have other affirmations, I'd love to hear them. So please DM me on social media at Growing Joy with Maria or shoot me an email at Maria at GrowingJoyWithMaria.com and let me know what affirmations you like to use. Okay, eight, grow flowers. You better be growing flowers in your garden. I hear you if you only want to grow food. I was like that too, especially when I was in New York City and I was growing plants on seven square feet. I felt like I didn't have space for flowers. I only could grow herbs and vegetables please grow flowers. I grew cut flowers for the first time last year and my heart exploded with joy growing dahlias for the first time. Dahlias are high maintenance. They are amazing. Zinnia, probably the easiest flower you can grow. Grow zinnias if you don't want high maintenance flowers like dahlias, but grow flowers. Flowers make people happy. That's it, right? We are hardwired as humans to love flowers. It might be because from an evolutionary standpoint, 
you know, our like cave man, cave woman body like sees a flower and probably knows that flower might turn into food, like might turn into fruit. So that might be a reason why we're so like intrinsically connected to them. I've released recently an episode on the history of flowers. Flowers are symbolically so historical, like flowers are a part of our world's history for a reason. There's an intrinsic kind of unspoken reason to why just like flowers are so important to humans. They're just little joy bombs just waiting to be grown and cut and gifted. And, you know, I was recently gifted this enormous bouquet of peonies from a friend And I took that enormous bouquet and I broke it into three different bouquets and I put the bouquets around my house. And every time I see them, I think of her and the way these peonies are just like unfurling. It's just it's exquisite. And their scent obviously is so beautiful as well. You know, we've been cultivating flowers as humans for 5000 years. (laughs) This is this is a tried, true and proven thing. Humans, we like to be around flowers. That's why the cut flower industry is so booming. So grow your own flowers, buy a 99 cent pack of zinnia seeds, sprinkle them around your garden and be blown away. The rebrand of this podcast, moving from Bloom and Grow Radio to Growing Joy with Plants, the rebrand was inspired by a zinnia I grew last year. There's a fuchsia zinnia that had bright yellow stamen on the inside that I was so taken by that I gave the fuchsia zinnia a photo of it to my business coach. And I said, this is the basis for the rebrand. Like, this is what I need my rebrand to look like. And that was the inspiration. And last but not least, and I know this episode is airing in the middle of the garden season. However, tis the season to start growing fall stuff. So there's no excuse here. And if you're even in the Southern Hemisphere and you're in your winter, there's something you you can apply this to your life too. Pick something you've never grown before and learn how to grow it. Even if you fail, you are going to learn so much. And growing something new is such an empowering, fun thing. You get to turn into a student again. You get to get your brain in a different mode. And that act of experimentation, that act of not taking yourself too seriously, that act of doing something just for the fun of it, right? Like what is a flower or a food that you like that you want to grow that you've never grown before? Buy the packet of seeds and like just figure it out. This year, I bought five different packets of sunflower seeds, and I'm just like tossing them in some compost and tossing the compost in my backyard as an experiment because I'd like to see these sunflowers grow. Realistically, the deer might eat them, but I want to try to make my backyard sunflower field, right? Do something to experiment just for the sake of experimenting. As humans, I feel like, especially in as gardeners too, we can take ourselves so seriously. I know I'm so guilty of it too. Don't worry, I'm not judging you. But we can take ourselves so seriously. And can you like incite a little level of play? Like, can you infuse a little level of play in your garden time? Can you sing to your plants? Can you grow something you've never grown before? Like, how can you just be a little sillier in your garden, right? Maybe that even just looks like, can you cut a bouquet of flowers and gift it to someone you don't know? So if you don't want to grow something you don't know how to grow, can you impart your garden harvest to someone that you don't know? How can you just stretch a little bit, right? Have some fun. Gardening is supposed to be fun. It is fun. It's so fun, right? Are you having a good time? Are you having a good gardening season? If you are, I'm so happy for you. Please write me and tell me about it. And I hope you can take at least one of these practices to even amplify your joy even more in your garden. And if you're not, that's okay too. Gardening is a lifelong hobby and uh, not every season is going to be a good season. You're going to have some ups and you're going to have some downs and that's okay. But how beautiful that we have this episode in the middle of the gardening season as a check-in. What's been going well? What do you want to keep fertilizing? What do you want to keep moving forward with? And maybe what hasn't served you in the garden? How can you course correct? Can you outsource? Can you ask for help? Can you downsize? But give yourself a moment to reflect and, you know, adjust the sales. And I'm always here for you. If you need someone to bounce ideas off of or advice, you can always write me at Maria at Growing Joy with Maria. You can DM me at Growing Joy with Maria. You can message me in the Growing Joy Garden Society platform. If you haven't joined us already, I hope you would. It's the coolest, plantiest, kindest corner of the internet. It's my app. It's my iOS and Android app. And you can also access it on your computer if you're not an app person. I created it so my community could connect. We have an international community of listeners, and I made this app so our community can connect. And the three pillars are to make new plant friends, propagate your plant knowledge, and grow more joy in your life. So you're welcome to grab a trial if you want. It'll be linked in the show notes. So with that, my plant friends, I hope you learned something new. I hope today 
you take action on one of the nine practices that I've shared with you to make your garden more therapeutic. I know that my garden is going to be an anchor and a source of therapeutic support for me this summer as I go through my journey dealing with this melanoma diagnosis. But even if I wasn't struggling with that, my garden would be my therapy. It's where I start my morning. It's where I end my day. Like I said, in the morning, part of my morning practice is when I make my coffee as the water's boiling. And then as I'm pouring it over, I come outside and I just like have a moment. I smell my herbs. I say good morning to my plants. I thank my trees on my property. And at night, I sit with my hummingbirds and I listen to the bird song and watch my flowers bloom. And it's just, it's amazing. Summer is the time to slow down, to be present. It's a juicy, juicy time to be able to engage with nature if you can. If you have kids, start them young, get them engaged in the garden as well too. I'd love to hear what you thought about this episode. I know that these solo episodes are a little bit different. We're diving more into the, you know, self-care, well-being, wellness aspect of gardening beyond just the how to care for plants side. It's so joyful for me to make these episodes for you. So let me know what you think. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast.